Hello and welcome to the eLearning Network July webinar. Thank you for joining us. The subject of this webinar is something close to all our hearts, learning, creating learning that people will love. Hence the title for ways to create learning that people will love and as our subheading explains using games and immersive technologies presented by this year's learning provider of the year, uh, Sponge. Um, over the next 60 minutes, uh, they'll be packing a lot in, including real life examples from Tetra Pak, Yum Brands, and Royal Mail, covering some of the biggest challenges facing organizations today from cybersecurity to workforce onboarding. And they'll be guiding you through how to create amazing learning experiences using exciting learning technologies such as virtual reality, applied games, interactive 360 degree video and multiplayer games. And there will be an opportunity for the participants to get involved too, as they'll uh, we'll be asking a few questions along the way and they'll get the chance to quiz us too. Now our very charming and highly impressive presenters are Jason Butler, who is a games developer by trade, but also an evangelist for the use of games in digital learning, and Lucy Gibbs, um, an innovation producer whose role is not only to think ahead in, uh, on learning technologies, but to explore and experiment so these ideas become reality. Um, both Jason and Lucy work for Sponge. Sponge is Europe's largest independent custom digital learning company. And it is a very special year for Sponge because they're celebrating 15 years of working with their global clients to deliver seriously creative learning solutions that drive business success. Plus, uh, you may have heard uh, of us as this year's, um, as, or excuse me, as um, heard of them as this year's winner in the Learning Provider of the Year at the Learning Awards 2019. What do you have to do to become a learning provider of the year? I don't know, but I think you probably have to do some pretty awesome stuff and be pretty good people to boot. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Jason, who is going to talk about barriers to overcome. Previous learning has been served up to them. Uh, as it says there, 46% of, uh, of learners cite dull content as a barri barrier. They're used to that whole sort of lots of text, click next, lots of text, click next, which in the modern speaking world is TLDR, i.e. too long, didn't read. Um, and that's very indicative also of the dropping global attention span. There was a recent study that um, made out that 32% globally has been a drop in, um, in attention span. So basically we need to create some learning that People are A, going to be inspired by and engaged with in that 1% of the time they've got time to actually engage with that content. And also it's got to be um, it's engaging enough so we can grab their attention and keep their attention. So we're going to start off straight away by asking you guys some questions. Um, get your intake on, on what type of learning do your people love most. So we're going to give you a few options here. Um, obviously, when we talk about games and immersive, so things like fun and enjoyable. Um, would that maybe um, grab your learner's attention? Uh, maybe something relevantly contextual to their, to their role? Um, something socially collaborative? Um, more about team working and, um, and the sort of communal learning? Maybe something enriching and developmental, maybe more around soft skills? Or something more empowering and self-directed? Um, unfortunately, we can't vote, so it's down to you guys. So yeah, let's see some votes. Bit of a tough decision, this one. I know they're all on. They're all key, relevant. key ones. Hmm. Currently, we're not seeing any results. So fingers crossed you're all going for fun and enjoyable. <laughs> um, I don't know how long Lena wants to run that for, but we'll, um, we'll give it a minute and see what the results are. Oh, so here we go. Oh, here we go. Fun and enjoyable, like you hoped. Done well, but more so relevant and contextual. So, yeah, learning has to be 
kind of aligned with what people are expecting and what they what's relevant to their role in order for them to love it. Um, social and collaborative, enriching and developmental, a little bit smaller, interesting. Um, but in essentially, I think that, that whole idea that being relevant to what they to what they do on a day to day basis is really important. So um, Lucy's now going to explain that, that was a bit of a trick question. Yeah. So obviously. Um, a bit mean that we made you pick one. All of them are very important to creating learning that people love. But the key thing that kind of underpins all of these aspects is really designing around the learner, putting the learner first and making sure that, you know, we really raise the bar of learning. That's something we really care about here at Sponge. So we really strive to make learning that people don't just tolerate, but actually love. And I'm actually saying that people loving learning. And we're going to show you some examples of that today. Um, so in this world where you saw Jason demonstrated that learning, um, capturing people's attention is hard enough, but in order for learning to occur, that attention has to be much higher than just kind of reading something. So you really have to make an effort into making something where that's going to capture people's attention and make something that's deserved, that deserves capturing people's attention. Why just teach people when you could kind of motivate them, inspire them and actually help them do their job better? And we're going to show you four different ways to actually do that today. So our talk's going to revolve around uh, two technologies, uh, immersive technologies. So this is things like 360 video and virtual reality and also games. We're going to be talking about four ways, two in immersive and two in games. And um, these are without a doubt two of the most exciting and most asked about um, kind of technologies, particularly because uh, it's Jason and, and my specialities. Um, but it's something that we're asked about more and more and people are getting really excited about and rightly so. Um, so we're going to be talking about four ways to incorporate this within your business. So the first of those four is exploration. Exploration and explorative learning is great because it allows people to learn at their own pace and have autonomy over their learning. It's also great for your organization because it helps you create a learning culture where learners can forage for the learning that they need that's relevant and contextual, exactly as you said before, um, as and when they need it. Yeah, and as I say, I'll be focusing on games and there's a really key part of, of um, how games are constructed, the main mechanic, is around mastery. Um, this is really important because um, obviously to grow someone's knowledge is one thing, but to raise it quickly from little or no knowledge up to mastery of the subject is really powerful. And also in doing so, your organization will benefit from things like an acceleration in, in employee knowledge and also in employee performance. The third point we're gonna be talking about is experience. Uh, we all know that it's better to do something for, for yourself than just read about it. So we should sh be showing people and not telling them. And from an organiza organizational point of view, um, if someone's tried something before, they're much more likely to apply that in the real world when it comes to it. And finally, we'll be looking at collaboration. Um, so as it's quite often the case, we very, very um, unnaturally learn things just on our own, in our own solitary silo, very much so from an early age, we've learned from other people. And it's really important to not forget the power of that collaboration. So in, when we use, we're creating digital learning, it's good for an organisation to use this as a route towards building a much more sort of motivated and engaged workforce. It's a really powerful tool. So first we're going to dig in an exploration and we're particularly talking about immersive technology here. So on the screen you can probably see a lovely quote from Frank Borman who's an, actually an astronaut and um, obviously flying around the moon is a very um, elaborate and eccentric form of a uh, human exploration, but you can also get exploration on a much humbler scale within your learning. Now Knowles tells us that adults in particular like to take initiative and have self-directed learning experience. And that's why exploration is so relevant to learning. Now we all learn differently and there's nothing more frustrating than being stuck in an experience that you feel is going too quickly for you or equally if it's going too slowly for you. We really want to be able to control our own learning experiences. Now, this is particularly relevant when we're trying to learn new skills or explore something new. Um, we want to be able to really persuade ourselves by taking ourselves on our own journey rather than you know, being forced down a linear pathway. 
Uh, it's also great because it's considerate of people's time. So if you imagine an experience where I just want to get to the answer, I don't want to have to sit through a whole module. I, I want to be able to get the relevant information as quickly as I can. Explorative learning is great for that. And the great thing about immersive technology means that explorative learning has become more exciting than ever. Now, we've got a really exciting example to show you here today. Um, this is a relatively new project that we've done with Tetra Pak, so not many people have seen it, so we're really excited to be showing it with uh, the lovely audience we have with us today. Um, so this is an example of a 360 desktop tour. Um, Tetra Pak, you might think you haven't heard of them. They're actually a really massive global company, and chances are if you go home and turn over your orange juice carton, you'll actually see Tetra Pak's logo on the bottom, because um, most of the kind of cartons we see today are actually created by Tetra Pak. Um, so, for, um, so for this, we um, really wanted to, um, we, we were given the challenge from Tetra Pak to, that they are a really innovative and exciting company and they wanted their induction to really reflect that. Um, and as well as that, they wanted to give their company a, a holistic view. So I, in an ideal world, they'd have the people from head office flown out to the factories to see what it was really like on the factory floor. And equally, the people in the factories being able to see the head office. But that's really costly and expensive and pretty much impossible to do in person. So they wanted to be able to create this in this immersive experience. There was also a number of core content that we had to cover. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this today. I think you just got a sneak preview, um, but I will go through this. Sorry, just having a little technical thing here. Okay, great. So as you can see, the experience opens in Tetra World, which is a fully illustrated map. There's no linear pathways here. The learner can scroll and find content in whatever order they like, although we do have these kind of prompts that help people uh, navigate through a an order, you know, if they, if they want the support doing that. Now, each of those locations on the map actually launched one of these 360 videos, which immerses people in a real location within Tetra Pak. So you can see this one is in one of their reception areas. So if I'm in the factory floor, I might never have seen uh, an area like this. So um, it's great for them to be able to see that. Um, as you can see, we've also got uh, these hotspots within the environment. So it's not just about seeing, it's also about learning and covering these core contents. So they want the people to learn about their vision, their mission, their values. And then um, we do that by kind of merging the two between content and these immersive experience. We have lovely Renee, who's a presenter. Um, a, a big part of starting a new company and what makes you feel comfortable and at home is actually the people that you meet along the way. So we were really keen to have a presenter that could kind of lead this experience. You can also see that we've added kind of gamified elements. So one big worry we have from clients when you have a explorative and non-linear pathway through some content is, oh no, what if our learners don't, um, don't see all of the content that's relevant to them? How do we know that they've completed everything? Now, our first answer to that is definitely trust your learners, particularly when they're new starters. Uh, they will be self-motivated to get the information they need. But if you do want a little bit of indication, and also as a learner, it's nice to have an indication of how far through and how much content you've got. Um, we can use kind of gamified techniques like you saw there of collectibles. So as you go through, you're collecting these stars. So you know within that room, um, we have four stars to collect. So I, I explore the content until I collect all those stars. Um, what we've got on the screen now is this kind of side panel as well. So um, if people want to get to a particular bit of information but don't want to have to kind of drag and round. So for example, if they're trying to refresh something they've seen before, we also have uh, methods in order for people to find that information quickly. So that sidebar gets people to jump to the hotspots they need as and when they need it. So this so far has gone down really well with learners. It kind of just shows that Tetra Pak want to give them an exciting first day when they get to the company, but it's also really considerate of their time because it lets them kind of dip in and out as and when they need it, find the information they need when relevant, but also if they do have a little bit of time, they're allowed to explore that at their own pace. Um, the other thing that, uh, that's great about this is it, it's allowing people to, um, you know, really apply the learning they're seeing in the context of the company. 
So you can see how this can work really well for something like an induction, but it can also work well when you're kind of exploring new processes, um, if you're going through uh, some kind of transformation in your business and you really want to take people on board with that transformation, um, this is a really good technique for allowing people to explore that at their own pace and really persuade themselves of the change that you're trying to make. You could also use these techniques to um, explore something like a customer journey, mm. so take people through the customer's perspective, or even um, a process like a supply chain. So there's lots of ways you could apply this in your own business. Well said. Right. Cool. So we're going to move on to the second point. Yes. So we're going to go moving on to games now, which is my, my little area of expertise. And we're going to look at mastery, as we mentioned before. Now, um, there's a great quote here from Raf Costa, which is basically explaining it, that within games, the main mechanic of any game um, is mastery. It's learning how the game's played. And then not only how the game's played, it's then becoming competent and then expert and to the point where you can beat the game. I um, mean, any game that's that's too easy to beat is very boring very quickly. Any any game which provides challenge is therefore much more of, of an enticing concept that you want to dig your teeth into and, and engage with much more. Um, and the great thing about games is if we apply some of those mechanics and those those core concepts to our learning, they really transfer well. I mean, there's some really good mechanics that they leverage. Things, for example, using scaffolding. So, if somebody um, is is new to something. Often there's a lots of onboarding, which is very, very sort of um, overt. It's very much handheld. It's like we, this is how the game works, and then they move on to the point where they're allowed to have their own autonomy, and they can carry on, and they move up from being noob to expert. So that's just a real sort of um, obvious path that we can use in learning. Also things like immediate feedback in a game. If you get something wrong, regardless of the game, you're going to instantly know that you got it wrong, um, and you'll learn from that, and then you can try again. Um, and if you employ that sort of technique into your learning, that immediate feedback is really powerful rather than somebody going through all the way through a module, so about 45 minutes of their day, get to the end to find that they haven't really got their head around the concept. Whereas if they're learning instantly along the way and getting that, that feedback to know that I actually made a misstep there or well done, you, you're really on the top of this, it's a really good um, enticement for them to carry on and, and, and be much more engaged in, in, the, in, the, in the now of, of that bit of learning. And that, that also tags into positive failure. I mean, there's a great stat that um, when people play games, often like big um, sort of experiential games, 80% of the time they're, they're losing, 80% of the time they're failing, but they still go back for more and more and more because that is positive failure. You're like, oh, I nearly got there. I'm, I'm tr gonna try a little bit harder next time to try and beat that level or overcome that obstacle or understand that, that strategy I need to overcome this, this, this part of the game. So if you can imagine that inside a bit of learning where you have that, you, you, might, you might fail at something, but it's not a negative um, situation. It's much more, it's a learning um, opportunity. And also things like replayability. Within games, lots of games, they have a very simple mechanic and you just repeat that same mechanic over and over again for different, different scenarios. So for example, let's say something like Tetris. All you are doing there is basically tessellating some shapes. That's, that's the simple mechanic. But as the game progresses, it, comes, it becomes more and more difficult how you're going to get those things to work. Um, and if you imagine that's much more about knowledge, um, um, understanding things, if you can re um, repeat questions or you can repeat um, the same mechanic, so people um, voluntarily go through the same thing over and over again, it's a, it's, it's a really good way of, of really embedding the knowledge that you're trying to get into them. And also there's a great thing about challenge. As I said earlier on, um, a, a really easy game is very quickly a very boring game because the learning is what you're trying to get and you're trying to sort of attain mastery in that game so if you can create some challenge i.e what they call hard fun so you're rather than being thrown in at a really simple level you're thrown in just at the very top end of your current amount of mastery of the, of the subject and as you get better as does the, the challenge so, so the whole thing sort of is an upward creep and before you even known it um, after a, a, a while of playing a game you suddenly got that that expert um, capability without even really knowing how you got there so that's, that's sort of what we want to sort of steal from games and push into learning. So if those player and organisational goals can be aligned, so as you're, you're learning or you're understanding the, the concept of the, the learning objective, then basically it's a big win-win because those organisational goals will be realised as a consequence of player success. So they're two really great ways of putting things together. Um, and so as an example of this, a real-world example, this is a, a game that we, we launched um, very recently, only last month, 
Um, essentially, cybersecurity is a really hot potato at the moment. A lot of our clients um, globally are asking us about cybersecurity. Um, so this is one of the biggest things on their agenda. So we've made sure that we've sort of catered for that. Now, this is like an off-the-shelf game. Um, it's based on a very simple mechanic, which is a binary swipe mechanic. And the idea is that we've tried to boil down cybersecurity into a very simple sort of um, mobile game, really. So the premise of lots of the old TLDR, too long didn't read stuff, all this information about malware and all the other sort of extraneous information, we've sort of chipped away and made it a much more real world example. So we've got a little video here which shows you some of those mechanics in play. So the premise of like scaffolding, we've got levels which are really overt. We've got very simple onboarding, so people are understanding um, through a playable demo at the very start how the game works. So as soon as they've got the, um, the idea that I swipe right for left, right for yes, and left for no, then instantly um, that's, that's, that's how you play the game. So now all that cognitive load that they get from here on in is learning the content. And straight away we're doing some scaffolding as well. We're showing them how things work. So if they go left or right, they're going to be told instantly, yeah, that's right, well done, you've got this. So it's, it's also that instant um, recognition and feedback that, okay, I, I'm understanding where I'm coming from here. And once we move out of training, so that's, that's all the training they'll ever need to how to play this game. We can then throw them into different situations, ask them different questions with the same mechanic, but test different areas of their knowledge. So for example, in this level, we'll be asking them about fishing. So um, we'll put them into a really well-known commonplace area, the office. I'm going to throw at them things like emails, um, documents and text messages which are very much a real world way that they will be con dealing with with data and straight away we can help them to recognize all those sort of things around phishing so we're, we're um showing them real world examples in a in a sort of a boiled down unreal environment but by because because it's in this sort of safe sandbox environment it means they can take those those um those challenges and if they get it wrong all that's going to happen is they'll they'll lose life and maybe have to replay the level and also that, that, so as you can see at the bottom there, there's the, the hearts which show you that where you've got one right or wrong. And we also have instant feedback, which is very much collected to that, that one question where they got wrong. And um, a great thing that's in, in most games, um, these, especially these sort of mobile games, is the idea of like a, a rating for each level. So although I've got two stars there and I can move on, that's gonna niggle. I wanna go back and get three stars. And so by doing that, I'm now exposing myself to a question bank of different questions. And so on. So now we're moving on to a completely different question. In this one, we're going to ask them about whether things are risks. And this can be the very much where the game is scaffolded. You're using the same mechanic to move up to the very top of the tree. Where um, And when you get to the top of the office in the penthouse, you're then all the levels you've gone through up to that point, you're then asked in a whole smorgasbord of questions. So um, you, Jason, yeah. just yep. a quick question uh, from, uh, from Eugenio. Who is this done for again? This is generic, so this is basically for anybody who has um, office face facing um, staff who are facing data. So it's a really good way to add it as like a, um, an, say for example, you, you did have a compliance suite um, where you had to learn about cybersecurity. This is a really good way for people to tuck in, um, in in a much more boiled down way to put those ideas and theories into practice. So this will be off the shelf. This, as I say, we launched this a month ago, but we actually launched a very similar game a year ago, so like the sister game to this, around the GDPR um, regulation came in. And the GDPR regulation, as, you, as you're, I'm sure all very well know, had really sort of um, over the, well not over the top, but they had really sort of um, punitive measures if you got things wrong with GDPR. So, so would, would this be downloadable, like if you went to Google Store or something? Would So, um most organizations were rolling it out to want it to be tracked so they will kind of launch it via either our LMS or, or their own LMS so we've kind of got options available there. Um, it's not available currently on the App Store mainly because uh, for, for that tracking reason most organizations particularly with the GDPR game want to have an audit to show that they their people have gone through the training but if, if you're interested in kind of talking about this anymore we're happy to kind of pick up questions or um, even give you a one-to-one -one demo after, after the webinar. Yeah, so, so that, that sort of gave you an idea of, of like that sort of mastery in action, but I'll let the results speak for themselves. This is like the GDPR game that we launched last year. Um, and to think that, so this is for really sort of compliance heavy, um, regulatory um, sort of knowledge, but make sure that people pass this. It's very important that you know, you've proved that your workforce have gone through the training. 
And people weren't just playing this because they had to. People were playing this because they wanted to. We turn in that need to need to um, sort of driver to a want to driver. For example, um, we had like example here of up to twenty five thousand global players. Twenty six of them went back, went over and over again. As I said, that idea of like each level where you have the potential to get three stars. If you only got one star, people had to go back and redo it. And people actually want to get the highest score possible. At the end, it unlocked a free play level where you can answer all the questions as quickly as you can against a timer. And in doing so, that meant that you're obviously just re-emerging yourself into all those questions and all that knowledge. So it became much more of a game than training, but people didn't realize they're still learning at the same time. There are some people that played in the weekends, people that played after work hours. So these are people um, because so engaged that they're actually having self-directed learning, their own intrinsic drive to carry on. Some people like in, in our office, when we, when we tried this in our office, we're, we're playing it on Saturday evening um, and I mean, to get somebody to voluntarily do compliance training on a Saturday evening in their own time out of work, it, I, I don't think I've ever seen that happen previously. So it, if you can create that sort of that engagement in, in something as mundane as, as regulatory training, then you obviously gonna get people to move from this is boring to I actually love this piece of learning. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's that's this is an example of how, get, how that sort of game mechanic can really help. I mean, and also, I mean, if you imagine this this um, is talking about uh, trying to engage the engage the workforce. If we can create an, an experience where this works, then any sort of regulatory training, any sort of compliance that we can boil down into these sort of um, mechanics is going to be a really powerful way to um, get your learners to love doing their learning. Yeah, I guess the evidence speaks for itself there a little bit, Jason. If people are spending half an hour on a weekend doing their learning, then, I mean, they must love it. Yeah. We, we, we hope it's because they love it. <laughs> just before we move on to the next thing, uh, just two more questions, sorry. Sure, thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, Kakoma Brown, um, I'll just tell you both of them. Uh, is, is this a type of inquiry-based learning? And from Phil Lord David, um, what software slash authoring tool uh, has this game been created in and has it used Java slash HTML coding? Cool, so if it's okay, I'll take question one, you can take yeah, question that, two, that's, Jason. That's so on, on, the, <laughs> on the first question, um, it is uh, a very scenario-based learning. So, so the whole idea is um, people aren't just being kind of the information dumped on them or having to read through it, we're using scenarios to embed learning. So it's it's kind of also a little bit of learning by failing. So in terms of inquiring learning, I, I, I think the answer is kind of yes, but it's instead of just questions, it's real world contextual questions that they're gonna kind of be faced with every day. So there's real examples of phishing emails. Some of the um, examples in the game are actually phishing attempts that happened at Sponge that we've, um, all have to learn from and, they're, and they're, so they're real, real world experiences that people get to go through where there's like over 150 different scenarios in the game and like in in a traditional kind of learning course when would you ever tolerate 150 questions or, or scenarios but in a game it suddenly becomes a lot more acceptable and also the questions that, that do occur often as if they're coming from peers to ask you your advice on something so it's very much you have to put yourself and empathize like what would i do in this situation so it becomes much more intuitive rather than just i've ticked a box and can move on it's much more oh actually in a real world example how how would i deal with this and that really helps to like help the behavior change as much as you know just learning information it's it's a way of like trying to change people's behaviors and and, and their own intrinsic way they deal with that situation if they were ever faced, faced with it in the real world yeah thank you i hope that answered your question that uh, give us another um Pop, pop a note through if that didn't answer the question. Do you want to answer the second yeah, one? Yeah, certainly. Well, we, we, um, we built this um, pretty much from the ground up. We didn't use an authoring tool. We used um, a HTML5 game engine. Um, there is one that we use quite regularly called Phaser. Um, if you've got any sort of JavaScript knowledge, it's a really, really good tool. It's, it's constantly evolving, um, but that's aimed, it's essentially sort of mobile first, but it can be also deployed onto desktop. So. We, we, it's a really good way of like leveraging all those sort of web technologies um, in a way that so it runs straight away on any handheld device. It's very sort of um, ubiquitous. It will work on Android and iOS, and also it will work on desktop and in, within browsers. So it's a really um, good way of leveraging um, the the sort of the fun and the and the sort of physics engine stuff you can get within within those sort of game engines. And then also we're we're instead of using it just to make a fun platform or a, or a little um, sort of casual game, using it 
the same they say in mechanics, but for learning. So hopefully that answer. So phaser, P H A S E R. Was there any other questions at this point, Leonard? No, that's that's it. Well, Eugenio asked if you did you realize it in Unity. I'm not sure if, what Unity is. If that's no, a Unity is a 3D um, sort of um, environment where you can. It's like it's an altering tool, but for for games. But no, this is all done purely in HTML or HTML5. So the whole thing is just written purely for the web. It's a browser-based game, so it means that um, it can be deployed. I mean, it can be wrapped. We haven't done that yet, as, as, as Lucy said, for the reasons where people want to have it on their own LMS, but it's the sort of thing that, you know, that we maybe in the future might consider doing so, but, um, but for now, it, that, that sort of, um, it, we've, we've avoided anything which can basically put a barrier between um, user and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the game itself. So if you serve it straight up in the, in the browser, it means they can play it on any device. Okay, and, and one last question before we move on. Would this run in older versions of Internet Explorer? Yeah, it goes back to like IE9. That's, that's kind of, um, because anything which has the canvas tag, um, which is usable is, I mean, to be honest though, I mean, most people nowadays are running sort of Edge and IE11 sort of as a standard. So it does it does go backwards, but um, as there, there is a definite cut, cut off point, which is, you know, that um, unfortunately, Older browsers are, are, are definitely becoming sort of deprecated, so it's it's much more not a case of us having to tailor for retrograde um, browsers, but people maybe having to think about moving on to a more modern browser. Um, it's sort of the definite the swings going the other way. I, I learned as well from from this uh, cybersecurity training that you know older browsers aren't um, preferable anyway because of the kind of security risks by not being updated. So I think um, companies generally we're finding are more yeah. switched on and more um, you know are more up to date especially compared to a couple of years ago yeah, i'd say totally. but i think it's to do with the kind of browsers auto updating as well a lot um so people do tend to have the latest version but yeah like jason said it caters uh for a few stages back but not you know the, the old dusty brick that you've got <laughs> yeah. in the back of your in, in the back of your office Okay, do you want to move on to... Uh... Sure. Um, so, yeah, great, exciting uh, game there. And that was all about mastery. Now we're going to be speaking about experience. And in particular, we're going back into immersive technology now. So to make a learning experience that someone's going to love, it really should be a memorable experience. And we care so much about that here at Sponge that we actually have a whole department dedicated to learning experience. So we, we take it very seriously. Um, so most of us will strive for some form of kind of experiential learning in whatever we do. So e even if we're making kind of like an e-learning piece, we'll want experiential bits in there for people to feel that, like they can apply the learning. Um, and we do that because we know that trying something for yourself is much better than just reading about it and much more memorable. Um, the great thing about the kind of new technology coming out and in particular VR, which we're going to be virtual reality that we're going to be focusing on today, um, is that these experiential learning are becoming more and more realistic, more immersive, which means that you're much getting much deeper learning. It's much more memorable and therefore much easier to apply. So the main thing kind of people love about experiential learning is they are get to be at the heart of the action. They really get um, to, to see it from their own point of view. Um, and it's also very emotionally engaging. If you're just reading about something, it's hard to imagine it in context, whereas experiential learning really helps you to see that learning, but also within the context of, of anything that's going on within that environment. Now we've got a, an example that we've, would like to talk about today. You may have already heard about it. It was all over the news uh, when we kind of released this last year um, because it's a particularly interesting uh, kind of topic. Um, so it's all about dog safety for the Royal Mail. Now that might sound like a bit of a kind of random topic, but actually um, over 2,300 men, postmen and women a year get bitten by dogs. So it's something that the Royal Mail take very seriously, obviously. Um, but it's not very easy to practice um, safe behaviours, safe dog behaviours with real dogs. Um, we have a dog friendly office here at Sponge, so we do encounter dogs every day, but um, it's not very practical to, to have people training with real dogs and also potentially dangerous. So what we wanted to create for them was a realistic VR environment 
uh, which people could kind of practice in and also explore consequences. So not just see the consequence of good practice, but also in a safe space, see the consequence of bad practice. Um, you don't just have to take my word for it here. Um, let's actually put the learner first and hear what he has to say. So we've got a video here from Sean, um, who will um, tell us all about his experience. I'm hoping you guys can hear this okay. If not, there's subtitles. I went into the driveway of a house, the gates were open. Nothing was in sight. I walked over to the front door, and all of a sudden, this border collie come off the front lawn. Now, I didn't see the dog until I literally got to the doorstep, and all of a sudden, it just lunged at me and got hold of my leg. Hi, I'm Sean Quirk from Formway Delivery Office. There was an awful lot of dog, dog attacks last year, so that we're doing everything we can to prevent it from happening again. It was a completely different way of learning. I mean, I've never seen a VR be used like that before, bringing it into a place of work and then showing you another way how to do your job safely felt like you were actually there and that's when it become real so you're almost like thinking wow I do need to have extra precaution I do need to be aware comparison to the VR to sitting in a classroom and going through a health and safety talk or whatever it is it's absolutely an amazing way to learn and I like it to the best way possible to prevent you getting attacked by a dog Wherever you move your head, it's it's like you're actually there. So if you focus your aim for a couple of seconds on that question or on that answer, that will then select you for that question or that answer. And I would recommend it not just to, to Royal Mail, but to any other company that was willing to bring in new technology like this. And thanks to Squinch, making the VR, it's, it's completely enlightened me to your surroundings and, and checking and check your surroundings before you enter the property where the main on that premises, so just to prevent anything happening in, in, in the future. So as you can see there, Sean's obviously had a very powerful experience with VR um, that's been memorable to him. I'm, I'm hoping that most of you could hear that. I'm sorry if that was a little bit quiet for you. Hopefully the subtitles help you navigate through it. But essentially he's talking about how um, he found the immersive approach much better for him to then be able to kind of apply the learning straight away and how it really helped him uh, just have a little bit more awareness about his environments and, and what to look out for. Now, this is maybe quite a niche uh, example of how VR can work well for learning, um, but we actually have a acronym to help us think of when uh, VR would be particular, particularly relevant. So um, we like to take our journey, our learners on a ride. So that's R-I-D-E. Uh, the first one is risky. So exactly like this example here, it would be very risky to train people with real dogs. So virtual reality is really good at creating an environment in which people can practice in a safe space. I is for inaccessible, so you might see examples of VR training where um, you get to go out on an oil rig. Um, that's a very difficult place to get to, and actually at Sponge we've created um, some immersive experiences for big pharmaceutical companies um, that wants people to be able to learn safety within one of their clean rooms. Now it actually costs a lot of money to kind of put people into a clean room and get one of those air showers. Um, so it's, it's very practical to have something like VR where lots of people can experience that without actually having to go through the protocol of, of having people in the clean room. The D is for dangerous, so uh, this could apply for something like fire safety training and it, it's really hard with something like fire safety. You could know all the steps you have to go through, but when you actually get put in that emotional environment where a fire is happening, quite a lot of what happens is all that information just falls from people's head. By having a VR and a realistic environment to practice in, um, it can show that people can not just know that knowledge, but they're able to apply it when push comes to shove. And finally, E is for expensive. Um, so 
even with that Tetra Pak example, if they'd flown their thousands of learners around the globe uh, to see what the company was like, uh, that would have been very costly, but VR can help people see that um, for, from the kind of comfort of their own offices. So as well as kind of these examples that I've mentioned, um, VR is also great for creating empathy. Um, so uh, I've seen a really lovely example actually where um, a doctor gets to see what life is like in the shoes of a patient and see what it's like to kind of interact with people. Uh, another example you might want to consider for your own organisation is putting your employees in the shoes of your customers so you can see what it's like um, from a customer's perspective and that actually helps embed learning because people will kind of empathise with someone else's situation and, and also understand the reason behind why they're doing something like good customer service training. So that's some great ways we can use uh, virtual reality. Um, we're gonna move on to our next and final point here now, Jason. Yes, um, and we're not suggesting that we make Fortnite so all our learners can go around firing guns at each other. Now the premise of, of the, this slide is, it's just purely to show that um, Fortnite, when it was launched, if you don't know, it's basically an online multiplayer um, battle royale game. But when it was launched, within a month, it had 120 million global players, which means that they had a, a basically an idea that was very, very powerful, very, very engaging, and obviously very, very popular. Um, and what I'm saying is that as learning professionals in digital learning, we should steal as much as we can from, from things that are obviously successful working outside of learning and see what we can use and leverage within learning. Um, basically, the reason this was so successful, I mean, as many as other games in similar sort of genres, is that it's a very social shared experience. So players could join this um, either um, individually, but now it's much more um, likely people join it as teams. So the idea, you get a team of players, um, and, and therefore you have this shared goal, and this, this, um, this part of a group think, and also you're learning from each other. Um, it's a really, um, communicative environment so people have to speak to each other to develop strategies to like the best way to deal with certain subjects as as they happen in real time now um, learning games should basically steal any good idea because why not if it's powerful enough to get 120 million people million people on board straight away then it's something that definitely we could use within our, within our own organizations so if you're going to create games that should become memorable for players engaging fun um, and those sort of game designers are trying to draw from those lessons. Um, for example, things like if you want to create a collaborative game, they re require mechanisms that basically cultivate teamwork. Um, you want to um, discourage any sort of competitive or anti-collaborative behaviour in players because obviously you would want to facilitate teamwork. So anything which allows people to go off as rogue or individual siloed people, that's going to try and um, dis discourage that. And also facilitating communication channels. These are really pivotal. Um, to make an, a player success during the collaborative gameplay. Now, um, as, an ex as a real world example of collaborative um, gameplay, but in a way that's definitely um, tied into digital learning, we recently did a, did a piece of work for Yum. If you don't know who Yum are, they're basically the umbrella company that owns real big global brands like KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell. Um, and they came to us with a, um, a requirement, again, for cybersecurity. It was, um, a thing they're rolling out across all their franchisees um, in a series of roadshows. They want to do basically the people are to understand the threats and, and the, um, a bit of an overall understanding of, of cybersecurity and how that could affect them in their business. Um, they created a, a series of roadshows, but currently they've done two launch events in the uh, US and in Asia. And um, they basically asked us to try and help them to de deliver this, this in, a, in a way that we really engaging and create a massive buzz around the subject and get really get the, the people within the organization talking. Um, so we basically went over to, over to the States, spoke to the cybersecurity team, and um, we've created this collaborative, innovative game, which can, combines a physical card game, which is what their initial idea was, with a much more engaging digital overlay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the, the video speak for itself. I'm going to just watch um, while these people play a, a test game and you'll see the level of, of like collaboration and, and teamwork as they're trying to sort of outdo each other.
So as you can see there, um, we've got people doing training on cybersecurity and at the end they're high-fiving each other. That's, again, something you don't often see in, um, in digital learning. Now, as you saw in that video, there was a collaborative game. There's five people um, assigned to a game and they're then divvied up into three being the security team, two being assigned the role of hacker. So that initially, as um, Lucy was mentioning before, helps to tap into empathy and the idea of role play, where you um, basically, from without knowing anything, you're, you're assigned a character, which allows you then to sort of try out something you maybe wouldn't do in your ordinary day-to-day -day job. So we have these two characters that are, that are hackers. Their job is to try and extort as much information as they can out of, out of Yum. And then the three people um, defending have got a limited budget with which they have to like make a strategy of like the best ways to defend themselves. Um, it allows people with absolutely zero knowledge uh, of, of cybersecurity to learn very quickly the kind of attacks that happen, whether it be like a physical attack or somebody going through your bins and stealing receipts to somebody like for, uh, attacking your, your, um, your mail server, for example, or phishing attempts, um, that sort of ways that people would ordinarily try to extort money or, or, or information out of the company. And conversely, the hackers may not know that what all these things that, that are in the arsenal of a hacker so it gives them that sort of outsider experience as well. And the game's played very much in real time. So they, 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 the cards, as you can see, have got QR codes on them, so they can be scanned, which launch an AR 3D model of an example of, of how something might, might look to help sort of engage it and stick it in their brains. Um, there's also an inbuilt glossary. So if there's any um, terminology that comes up they're not familiar with, we're able to like do um, learning in the moment to find out what they need to what they need to, to understand a certain choice or help sort of facilitate a strategy and, and there's also things like um in in game play so if i sent a hack over to the to the yum team and actually got past their defenses they then have to make some real-time action and some just-in-time sort of strategy to quickly try and um, negate that attack but the hackers are also trying their hardest to hack in as much as possible to gain reputation which enabled them to like feel that they were Although it's conversely against, no, they don't, obviously they're not going to promote hacking, but you get this whole idea of breaking the rules, which is a really good way of getting people to engage with something. You're, you're basically giving them permission to break the rules. And that, that is a really also another powerful game tool. So and, I definitely uh, can take something there then. Just a quick question from, from Eugenio. Uh, The, how did the instructions work, just to clarify? Like, how did people know what roles they had and um, so forth? Okay, well, that's basically the way the game works, at the very start, um, you're asked to um, pick, a, pick an avatar, really simple um, interface. So uh, there was like a, a, a whole sort of slew of, of um, icons that you could pick as your, as your sort of like your online persona. Each were assigned a random name, which like very sounded very sort of hackerish like prankster or sphere or whatever. <laughs> and, then, um, and then once all five, en five names are entered, then it, it basically divvied up between the two devices that you're using. Okay, you two are the hacker team, you three are the defenders. And then there was a really minimal bit of onboarding. Um, the first bit would be how much you currently know about cybersecurity. And then they asked, asked answering that question. It was a really good way of then getting some qualitative data as like how transformative the whole thing was. And it, it's just as each, um, each part of the game goes through. The first time you do anything, there's a little bit of um, scaffolding to say, okay, to, what you need to do now is, if, for example, scan this card or pick this many cards from the deck. So it was really sort of um, gentle onboarding um, so people learnt as they were doing. And then once you've, done, once you've scanned one card, you know how that works. So then you're off and, you're off and running. So it was a really um, minimal amount of, of hand-holding at the start because the idea is this can be played in a room with, say, 10 teams, so there's like 50 people playing at once or at the same time, multiplayer game. Um, so the, the minimal amount of people have to go around and go, oh, you need to press this button or you need to click that. We want to try and me, um, get rid of as much mediation as possible. So it was very much an autonomous and explorative game. So we don't want people you know, needing to be, have somebody wander around as a mediator to explain how things work. So that, the, the idea is it's that onboarding is built into the game in a very sort of intuitive way. Yeah, I think the really cool thing about this project is, is we could have just done it as a card game and it would have worked, but the, the facilitation would have needed to be uh, kind of more there. Whereas the digital element of this really made it a, a kind of self-led experience because 
you didn't need someone to tell you what to do next. The, the iPad that you had with you could talk you through the experience. It could split up your teams for you to tell you who's doing what. So you don't need that person to do it for you. So it, it really enables, like Jason said, the scale that yeah. you needed so you could have lots of teams going at the same time. But it also just helped teams kind of lead the experience for themselves, which helped collaboration, yeah. rather than having someone tell them what to do all the time. I mean, there's a great thing with dig any sort of digital-based game is um, if you had a, a board game, there's, there's normally somebody in, um, in, in one corner of the game with a massive folded out piece of A1 paper trying to find what the rule is if you roll That's a six. Always me. Um, <laughs> That's always um, me. Whereas in, the, in a digital game, if, if you're not allowed to do something, it just doesn't let you do it. There's the, and if, if it's not your turn, what will happen is your screen will say, the, the other team is currently deploying a card, why not look at the glossary and find out some more information? So you, there's the, you're never at any point idle or wondering what can I do next. It's all very much led by the by the game itself, so it allows people to you know understand what's going on without any sort of confusion. And you try and that's the, I mean that is the the art of any sort of digital game is getting people to understand without having to like dump loads of expositional um, exp explanational stuff onto people. Um, so that's that, so that was an example of of, um, of making a collaborative game to really drive people's motivations and, and get them engaged. And as I say, we've only rolled this out for two test launches, one in Asia. One in North America, but in the, at the end of the year, this is going to be sort of rolled out across all their franchisees. So um, we'll keep you posted as far as you know that that goes, and any sort of feedback and, and real time quality to data we get back from those. Um, but there, I mean, obviously this is for example for cybersecurity. But if you can imagine you want to create a buzz in your industry around sort of any sort of key organizational activities, like for a, a new product or a new process, or maybe even a way to understand the workings of an organization. You can use this as a business simulation, for example, not necessarily this game, but this sort of game, this collaborative game engine, which gets people really talking about something. And then once you create that buzz, then it organically um, virally spreads. So yeah, that's, that's an example of, of collaboration. So we'll just... Um... So we've covered a lot uh, today. Uh, we'll give you a quick recap before we go into questions. I think we've got about five minutes left for questions. So before we move on, uh, we'll do a quick recap. So um, exploration, we looked at how we could use immersive 360 video tours to help people on board. Um, we looked at mastery. So the, um, the this cybersecurity swiping game, um, which basically helps to master dense compliance topics like GDPR and cybersecurity. With experience, we saw how postmen, men and women were using VR to raise awareness around dog safety. And also finally, just the last one, we're looking at um, how a multiplayer game at Yum um, basically created a buzz around cybersecurity and raising awareness of threats. But the main thing we want to take uh, you to take from today, um, if nothing else, and even if um, games and immersive technology are outside of your remit at the moment, just try and put the learner first consider, is this an experience that I want to go through? Would I like this? Would I even love this experience? And if the answer is no, think of ways you can actually embed bits that people are gonna love, like exploration and collaboration into any learning that you're doing to make a better experience for your learners. So we had a poll quickly. We'd like to ask you a question before we open you up to answer our questions. If uh, you're gonna kind of do this in your own, uh, kind of organizations, which four uh, would your people love most? Which, oh, which of these four, yeah. I'm only gonna let you pick one, unfortunately. So so would you think something revolving around experience? Um, so maybe something where you're throwing people in into a, a virtual environment, maybe something around mastery. So maybe utilize some of those game mechanics to try and hook people in to engage them. Exploration, so maybe um, something which might help to people to learn at their own pace. Or finally, the example we showed with collaboration. So um, which of those do you think would actually you know, be a real hit in your own organizations? This is the bit where Jason and I get very competitive about yeah. who's, who's gonna come out on top. Um, we can't see the results yet, so, no. so waiting with bated breath. Tension is mounting. Yeah, so we've got uh, just a few more people left to respond, so we'll give it a, okay. a few more seconds. Jason. I'm gonna try and steer it anyway, but I was quite happy last time. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody who hasn't voted yet, okay, it looks like that's what it's going to be, so I'll end it now. Results are in, and they are... Uh, mastery! mastery. Yeah. Nice! So... Yeah, that, I think that's, 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 that's a, as, you, as, as we showed with those, those, um, those stats after the, the launch of the GDPR game, that there is a real um, sort of, I don't know, the, the love thing that we've been talking about, getting that love into your learning, really was self-evident because people were playing it of their own volition 
outside of working hours. They're basically doing compliance training on a Saturday night. Um, one guy played it like 30 odd times to try and get the high score. As, and, and, that's, and this is a GDPR game. So <laughs> if you can involve it, like instill that sort of engagement into a piece of learning, then you're, it's, a, it's a massive win-win. So yeah, it's great to see mastery. Cool. And yeah, experience still gets an honorable mention, so that's great. Okay. So right, over to you now. Um, do we have any questions on the more section um, that we can answer for you before we go? Leonard, are there any questions you'd like us to answer? Uh, no, not, there doesn't appear to be any, uh, any questions. Um, oh, uh, one from Eugenio. Was there just one tablet or did every person have their own in the collaboration game? Uh, well, we basically designed that to be uh, bring your own device because obviously the idea that um, they essentially you play with two devices, so a bit like computer battleships, for example. So the hackers are on one device and the defenders are on another. We, we set it up so it could be played on a phone or on a, on a tablet. We, rec we recommended tablet because obviously you've got more speed, um, screen space, but it can be played on a phone. Uh, but we, that because of that, we had to make some sort of limitations on, on um, how far back that would, that, would, um, that would degrade. Because obviously if somebody turns up with a Nokia, Nokia 3210 trying to play this game, it's not going to work. So we had to... There was like certain uh, a level of um of the most recent sort of version of an online so mobile Android browser or iOS. So we so we could like give give a a, a definite cutoff point. If if you tried to play it on an on an older piece of kit, it would basically tell you, unfortunately, your this 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 um device is t is not modern enough to play this. So basically, it was very overt and um. So one one of the suggestions we had, um, if this can be rolled out to somebody else, and they're going to do it on a, in a similar way as a roadshow, then they maybe could um, invest in like a, a handful of tablets that they knew it would run on, and therefore that would that would negate that sort of idea of any sort of um, um, imponderables. But it is basically designed to work on any device. Okay, uh, I have two more questions, and probably about a minute left before we have to end the session. Sure. Right. Um, uh, from Simon Bolum, in your opinion, what's the best software? to introduce a beginner to adding hotspots to the video. And Eugenio asks, was it built in phaser as well? Uh, that was the, 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 the young game, I'll quickly answer that one, was um, it was part phaser, part um, uh, sort of 3D um, JavaScript. There, there's, there's libraries out there for, you, for using JavaScript and there's server side stuff. So it's all, that's all still JavaScript, it's all still web, web technology, so it's not, Built in anything like Unity or um, or any of the other those sort of those three D authoring tools, it was very much built browser based first. As I say, that helps it to be much more ubiquitous. As far as the other question, um, hotspots. So I mean, we, we've done hotspots in video for um, in, in authoring tools like um, Storyline, for example. So you can, it depends on, on what your what your preference is. I mean, there there is lots of sort of stuff out there you can use off off the shelf. There are there are um, tools. Um, that one again, we built our own, our own from scratch, our own um, sort of 360 video uh, piece of software. So it's like it's like Sponge built it from the ground up using using web technology in order for us to do that. So um, for, if for a novice or something new, I'd say maybe look into like authoring tools that are, have maybe played around this. So I'd say maybe storyline stuff like that. Um, but as well, I say, it's, um, it's one o'clock. Um, Thank you very much for a, a really interesting and um, inspiring session. And um, thanks very much, everybody. And um, thank you for joining. No problem. No, Sorry you. we didn't get more time for kind of questions at the end. But if you sign up to our newsletter, we've got kind of loads of information. Great uh, newsletter there for you to kind of find out more. Or feel free to reach out to us to on our kind of all our details are on our website. So if you want to have a chat with me and Jason, yeah. or even link, link with us on LinkedIn, we're happy to answer any extra questions that come through after, after this session. Definitely. And thank you so much for having us, Leonard. Have a, have a great weekend, everyone. Yep, thank you. Happy thank Friday. You. <laughs> Bye.